I want to I want to tell you you're you're in for a treat, and I, I gotta I need to set this up as soon as quickly as I can because it, it, I, I need to tell you how we got to where we're at because this is really 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 important. So when I moved from Kentucky in my teenage years, I grew up in Tampa, Florida, and I grew up at a church called University Church of God. And when I became a Christian, um, I had long hair and I played rock guitar, and so I showed up on a Wednesday night after I'd given my life to the Lord with an amp, a guitar walked into the youth group, said, I'm here, I play guitar, my name's Chip, I just got saved. And they were like, all right. So they just sort of, I don't know why they did, they shouldn't have, but they just sort of turned it over to me. <clears throat> Guess they thought I was a prophet or something, I don't know. But uh, I just started playing guitar and we were blowing up speakers and fire was coming out of the speakers and the kids thought we were putting on like a pyrotechnic show and the youth group started growing. It was, it was fantastic, but across the um, a town was another youth group called High Places, and they had like 300 some odd kids back in. That was a really large youth group. And when their guitar player wasn't there, I'd go play the guitar, and then sometimes I would go there. And the youth pastor there, his name was Craig Altman. And, you know, and I didn't know Craig super well, but I knew him some. And then, you know, as time went on, he moved out of youth ministry and he started this church called Grace Family Church. And, you know, I, I knew that that was going on. And then, you know, I you know, moved on, and then we started Grace Community Church. And, <clears throat> remember I had reached out to him and talked to him. We talked a little bit on the phone. And then um, and in the last sort of year, um, we started regularly getting together. And we, maybe every five, six weeks or so, every whatever, 10 weeks, we get together and have lunch. And it's great for me because Craig's church is now 30 years um, old and they run about 13 or 14,000 people on the weekend in Tampa. And they have eight locations um, and so it's great because I can talk to him about what's going on here and <clears throat> he knows because he, he's been there. Here's the cool part. A couple of years ago, they did um, one of their big services at Amelie Arena and they filled that place up. This Easter, Grace Family Church in Tampa, Florida is having their Easter service, ready for this, at Raymond James Stadium. Okay, <clears throat> like I mean, incredible. They probably have 30, 40, 50, who knows how many thousands of people will be there um, and it's, it's incredible. I mean, what, what they're doing is incredible. And what I most appreciate about Craig, honestly, is he's just the unassuming guy. He's just a good dude. And it's hard sometimes to find pastors that have large churches that don't have a little bit of an ego or a little bit of whatever, and, and he has none. He's just a good dude. It reminds me, I feel like when I talk to him, I feel like I'm talking to like the old youth pastor when I was a kid, and it's been a wonderful, wonderful relationship. So I asked him, I said, would you come down and speak? He said, yeah, that's no problem. I said, I would love to have you come down and speak. And he said, well, when I go out, he goes, Chip, I have, in 30 years, I've very rarely gone out and spoken at other churches. I just sort of stay here. He says, but when I go out, I got like one message that I speak and do. And I'm like, what's great? What do you speak on? He says, well, I like to speak on generosity and giving. I'm like, man, that's okay. I mean, I wasn't expecting that, you know, you know, it just wasn't. And uh, I was like, okay, um, let me think where I can put you in. I'm like, I know what I'll do. Beginning of the year when we do our culture series is I usually do a giving sermon that, that, because it's first of the year and I like to get people thinking about just, you know, that's part of what we do and, you know, serving and other stuff and giving. And I said, why don't you come in January and speak on giving? And he said, that sounds great. January rolled around, he called me and said, hey, listen, I got person at the church that I, I got, they're having a wedding and I got to go attend the wedding. <clears throat> I can't do the thing. And I was like, that's fine. I said, when can you do it? Um, surprise this weekend. Um, but uh, he said he could come down and, and I said, great. I said, we'll come down and, and speak. And I'm going to tell you something sincerely. Three services have gone on now. This is the fourth one. And I mean, it's just, it's been such a blessing that he's, he's, just, he's just a good dude. And you're gonna really get something out of what he has to say because it's, it's not the normal thing you would hear. It's so good, it's profound. And I promise you, this is like life-changing information for, for, for many of you all. So could we give a huge Grace Community Church welcome to Pastor Craig Altman right. from Grace Family Church. Love you, Love you, man. Go get him, all right. go get him. Yeah, all right. That'll be the last time you'll clap probably today on this. Hey, uh, Pastor Chip is amazing. Uh, I hope you know, I, I get to meet with a lot of pastors. He's the real deal. You got a great pastor here. I hope you know that, man. You do, yeah. We spent a lot of time just sharing and talking, and he loves God, loves people. Great 
preacher. I love your outreach of this church where you're just out in the community. That's what God wants us to do. I just wish I had a picture of him when, when he was playing uh, that guitar, that long hair, shredding that guitar. I mean, can you see Chip of long hair? I don't know. It's just kind of, we should have got one like that. But um, yeah, I mean, money, it, it, it creates a lot of tension and conflict and emotions. I know normally when you bring a guest speaker in, they make you feel really good. And uh, this will be the opposite. You may not feel good right now, but hopefully you'll feel better later because if you apply God's financial plan and principles to your life, it, it, it does change everything about uh, what you think and feel uh, about money. I, I, I think sometimes I, I feel like a dentist. Anyone love going to the dentist? Yeah, no. You know, last night I was saying, anyone love going to the dentist? This lady was going, I do. And I'm like, you're weird. What was Her husband was a dentist. So that was kind of funny. But, you know, a, a dentist, uh, you know, you go and you know that you may experience some pain, but you know the eventual outcome is he's going to make you better. And so today, we're going to drill down a little bit. I might hit a few nerves, and I have no Novocaine, okay? But I, I really believe so much in this uh, that, that it's gonna, you'll be better later if you'll trust and apply uh, these principles uh, to your life. Here's what I know in 43 years of, of pra more than that, of practicing this, these principles that it, it'll eliminate, it'll at least reduce financial stress in your life. You'll experience God's faithfulness with provision and needs. It'll eliminate financial conflict in your marriage. They say one of the number one reasons of divorce with couples is financial conflict. Um, and, 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 and also you'll learn contentment. I think it's so important. So the outcome of obedience will be, will be these things. But we're going to just give you two basic principles. You already know these. The question is, are we doing them? There's a lot that we know that we don't do. How many of you know that the, the first thing when it comes to stuff and money is the Bible tells us that he owns it all, right? I mean, he owns it all. He owns the silver and gold, the cattle on a thousand hill. He owns even us. He says, your body doesn't even belong to you. And so we understand this is the attitude we need to have, but it's, we struggle because we come out of the womb and the first thing you're trying to teach your children is what? Share. No, it's mine, right? That's what you feel. And we still feel sometimes that it's mine. In fact, King David gives us a great example of this. He's, he's raising money to build the temple that his son Solomon was going to build. So they take this big offering and David, the offering is so huge and overflowing. This is David's attitude when they receive the offering. In, in First Chronicles, it says this, but who am I and who are my people that we could give anything to you? Everything we have has come from you. Come on and say, has come from you. Say it together, he has come from you. And everything we have comes from him. That's a basic principle of ownership. And he goes on and says, and we give you only what you first gave us. So David sees it. He goes, God, we're only giving, we're really just returning what you've already given to us. This is David's attitude when it came to giving. And, and, and it's, it's such a powerful principle because I, I believe it. It's easier to give what doesn't belong to you. If you really believe it doesn't belong to you, it's easier to give. Anybody play golf? Any golfers out there? I'm a golfer. Golf will keep you humble. That's a separate sermon. It'll keep you humble. Trust me. My wife says, why do you play so much golf? I said, because I want to stay humble, Debbie. Um, but I was out golfing with a friend of mine, and I, I said, hey, there's the, the cart person, girl. Here's $20. Go and, you know, get us a couple Gatorade. So he comes back, and I said, where's my change? He goes, oh, I just tipped her. You tipped her $10? Well, yeah, I just wanted to bless her. I said, well, it's easy to bless her when it's not your money, right? But isn't, it, but isn't that principle true? When, when it's not ours, it's easier to give. I'm going to prove that. Uh, Grace uh, Community Church is giving money away this weekend. And, and where is Jaron? Is Jaron here? There he is, man, front row. See, it pays to sit on the front row, Jaron. This is your money. Here it is. There's, there's $100 in there for you. Okay, and it, it's yours, okay? There you go. You have a seat. So you can have a lot of friends after the service. There you go. All right, give Jaron a hand. Yeah, there you go. So, so here, here it is. Here's what we do know that, um, you know, the last thing to get baptized in a person's life is their wallet. Uh, didn't you guys have baptism last week? 40 people going down. Can you see that holding that wallet? But that's true. There's tension for all of us. This is the last thing that we surrender. And I, I, I get that. They tell us that 70% 
of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. That is stressful. That is not God's financial plan for your life. God has a better plan in how, how we should manage it. And, and so God has a better way. And here's the better way. There's so many of these verses. I'm only picking a few because of time. There's a lot of verses that talk about giving God the first part of your income, your first fruits, your first lamb, your first son, right? There's a lot of those verses that talk about the first, that God wants the first part. He doesn't want the leftovers. That's how God wants it. That's the way that we honor him. And in Proverbs, it says this, honor the Lord by giving him, here it is, the first part of all your income. Now it says all your income. Isn't that interesting? It says all your income, all your revenue streams. You know, the other, I've read this verse a million times, and about three years ago, I was reading this verse, and God said, you're not giving me all your income. God, what do you mean? I tied. He goes, no, no, no. You know, your house that you just sold, you had all that equity in, and you're building this other home? I said, yeah. He goes, well, that equity was built, that's, that's income. And then when I heard that voice, I said, I rebuke you, devil, I don't wanna hear that. <laughs> I, I really, because it, it was a, you know, the, how many of you know the larger the amount, sometimes the harder it is to, to give? It, the, the percentage seems to go down the larger the amount, but I kind of ignored it for a couple weeks, and then a couple weeks later, I'm, I'm actually prepping for this message, and he says, you're gonna preach that without, I said, okay, God, I surrender. So we all struggle. We are, and it's okay to struggle as long as we eventually obey, right? So anyway, I, that's, that was for somebody. I don't know who that was for, but here it is. Giving him the first part of all your income, and he will fill your barns with wheat and barley and overflow your wine vats with the finest wine. So here's a principle. We honor God, and then he will take care of us, our income, our barley, our barns. That's what God does. When we honor him first, then he does these things. So Jaron, come on up here again. You thought that was yours, didn't you? Now, stay right here. Stay right here. Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to honor God. So, this, this is $100. This is real money. This isn't monopoly money. So, which, which part does God get? The first 10 or the second, last 10? Which one does he get when we give to God? It's, the first, it's always the first. And, and the challenge of giving God the first, it takes faith to give God the first because we're nervous that if I if I, what if I don't have enough at the end of the month? So a lot of times we hold on thinking just in case. Well, that's not faith-based, that's fear-based. God wants us to honor him with the first part. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna honor God and, and the rest of this is yours. Here you go. Really, that's yours. You keep it. Do what you want with it. You can have a lot of friends want to go out lunch with you today. All right, so here we go. So that's, that's what, so he, he, he gave the first part and some of you are thinking, what a weak example. I mean, of course, I, if I was on the front row and you gave me $100, I would give 10 back right away because it's not mine. Let me ask you a question. What's the difference in that and the paycheck you get every week? Same response I get in my church. Quiet, right? I mean, it's, but there is no difference because all that we have, all that we earn comes from him. The, 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 the ability to, to gain wealth, the ideas you have, the favor to close that deal, to build that company, all of that comes from God. He gives us the gifts and the abilities we have, and, and when we acknowledge that by giving back to him the first part, we're acknowledging God as owner, and he's the one that gives me all, all that I have. And, and, and that's the principle that, that should be working uh, in our lives. In fact, it says, Matthew 6, Jesus says this, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. And that's what we're worried about, the things. Now, if you read the verses preceding, Jesus is talking to the people and he says, hey, don't worry about your life, what you're gonna eat, what you're gonna drink, what you're gonna wear. My heavenly Father knows that you need these things. He goes, look at the birds of the air. They're not worried and my Father feeds them. There's a principle of trust involved with putting God first. Because then in verse 33, he says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you. So we have to realize when we put God first, he will take care of our basic needs. He, he really will. So here's, here's what, what happens sometimes when I, when I share this kind of message. Uh, people are they're very sincere and they, they think, I, don't, I just need to make more money. 
and I won't have these issues. I, I, I don't know if that's always the case. In fact, I believe it's not an income problem, it's a money management problem. I, I've seen it, I've seen people go, and, and I, if I only can make this much a year, then I'm gonna be good. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people that make 100K a year that come up to me and go, I'm overwhelmed, I'm stressed out. I'm making more than I've ever made, but I'm more stressed because they never understood the money management part. And, and I, I remember one time, true story, I, it baffled me. This guy came up to me, and I knew who he was. I didn't know him that well, and he goes, I'm really struggling. I'm like, how could this guy be struggling? Because I knew his occupation. He was a doctor. I know what he was driving. And I'm like, struggle? He goes, and true story, I, I make 900K a year, and I'm under the water. I'm underwater. And, he's, and I'm scratching my head going, and, and the good news is he realized that he had to start controlling his yearnings because if he didn't control his yearnings, they would always outpace his earnings. So no matter what income level you're at, God wants us to be good stewards, good managers of all that we have. Okay, so that's, that's just one of, the, one of the principles that we have to understand. See, it's not wrong to have wants, unless your wants control your ability to tithe and to save. Proverbs 21.20 says it this way, wise people live in wealth and luxury, but stupid people spend their money as fast as they get it. Now, I didn't call you stupid. The Bible says that when we spend all that we have, it's not a wise way to live. So wealth and luxury isn't necessarily how much you make, do you have margin in your life? Do you have margin between what I make and what I spend? Because the more margin you have, the more peace you'll have in your life. Trust plus self-control equals financial peace. So many of us, we think, I just need the promotion, I need to be making more, and I believe all that can be true, but we have to figure this part out. What is my level, what is my benchmark of contentment? Every one of us have to figure that out, whether you're 25 or, or 75. We have to figure uh, that part out. Here's what we know. Our lifestyle, left unchecked, will outpace our earnings. Um, you know, we, 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 we have to understand, it's, it's like anything. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, to, to stay fit, and, and when you're on the big screens and stuff, they, they, you know all that high D stuff they got now? It shows everything. I, and I'm, I've realized, wow, I better, I better get in shape. So, you know, you're always trying to figure out, how do you lose weight? There's, go to the bookstore or online, there's tons of books on how to lose. You can read all of them you want, but you know what the bottom line is, what I found out about losing weight? And this is free. You came all the way to church for this. Here's how you lose weight. You eat less. <laughs> I, I, I can tell you, I can, I can out eat my cardio all day long. Okay, you can, you can cardio all day, but you know, it just, it doesn't work unless you decide I'm going to eat less. Same thing financially. You want financial fitness in your life and you're not fit right now. It's not about hitting the lotto or getting your uncle. It's about starting to spend less. And that's where it's painful because we don't want to spend less. We want everything now. We compare ourselves with other people that are not even in the same income level. You can't do that. You ever notice sometimes you feel really content with your house until you go to a model home center? <laughs> Worst thing you can do, right? Now you go back to your shack, right? You, you, can't, you, you can't do that. And so we got to learn self-control. This is where I talk just for a few minutes. Uh, I was married in 1980. My wife and I have been married 43 years. Come on, yeah, yeah. And uh, she was here last night, is not here today, but it's just... We, we, when we started our marriage, listen, we had a lot of love and not a lot of money. And we knew early on, we said, we want to make sure that we're tithing. We want to honor God. We want to put God first. How many know that every time you decide to do something you know is the right thing to do, you'll be tested? Tithing is a test. It is a test. I remember Debbie and I, we were first married. We were driving two old cars, happy, in love, but driving two old cars, and Debbie had an old VW bug, Beetle, right? And the floorboard, I guess it was from up north, the floorboard was rotted through. And when it would rain and she would go through a mud puddle in her car, the mud would come up through the car and splash her. You, some of you are laughing. She wasn't laughing. <laughs> One day she'd come home and she said to me, Anna, I'm just telling you where, was, where we were at. I've had enough. We're tithing. We're doing everything we do. And this car is, is I'm, I'm getting, and I mean, she was in tears. 
And I didn't do one of those weird things like, just trust God, honey. That's a stupid thing to say at that moment. I empathized. I said, you're right, Debbie. I don't know what to do. And I remember going through my budget going, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and we're going to get her a car. It'll be a car payment. But that car payment was about the same amount as my tithe every month. And I almost rationalized and said, you know what? God will understand. But I said, no, I've got to honor God first. And I remember the temptation that I had to take the tithe that belonged to God to do something else because I didn't think God was going to meet the need the way I thought he should meet it. Anybody been there? I've been there. And I remember us trusting God and waiting. And sure enough, God worked out that situation. To, I, and I can tell you story after story. Let me just say this. You don't always have to live that way. But I can tell you, God wants to see that you're faithful with a little. Can you be faithful with a little? And so that was the beginning of our marriage. And, and again, we didn't do credit cards back then. We just didn't want to. We, did, we don't want to pay interest on something. I don't want to buy a couch for $3,000 on credit and end up paying $6,000 for it. You know what I mean? Over a period of five years. And so a lot of our, our first apartment was all used furniture. My mom was a garage sale queen. She'd find stuff. And so we finally have pretty much everything for the house. We're all excited, except we didn't have a couch. And we prayed and, and, and you know, we'd love to go buy a new one, but we knew we couldn't do that. And as we were praying, literally a day later, my grandmother calls, 86 years old. Greg, I got a couch for you. And my wife's rolling her eyes because she knows she's seen grandmom's couch. And I'm like, yes, and she's going, no. We go pick up the couch, sure enough, outdated yellow floral print, but my grandmother decided to wash the middle cushion because it was dirty and it shrunk the middle cushion. So now we have a couch with gaps in it. So I'm just, I'm just telling you, but we wanted to honor God and we said this is where, and you know what, sometimes starting out it can be tough, but let me tell you something, God's faithful. I don't have that old couch anymore. Fast forward, man, to, as you're faithful to the Lord, God begins to do things you never dreamed he could do in your life. But I think there's a point in time where we got to say, I'm going to trust God. I'm going to honor God. Uh, I'm going to put him first in our life. I, I remember when we started having kids. How many know kids can cost money? Come on, amen to that one. And they're always putting pressure on you, right? One time we were out, uh, uh, boy, I've got to keep moving here. I was out, uh, we, we didn't go out a whole lot to eat because it was expensive. Our kids were not deprived, but one day we said, hey, we'll go to McDonald's and, and get a burger or whatever. So we get to McDonald's, and my son Brent, he's probably five at the time. Hey, Dad, I said, yeah. Hey, I want a happy meal. I said, why? Well, Johnny gets a happy meal when he comes with his dad. And, you know, all a happy meal was a jacked-up price for a bunch of toys. That, you know, it was just, and I said, Brent, you don't need a happy meal. And he goes, why? I said, because you're already happy. <laughs> I know I'm a harsh parent, so no, actually, uh, you know, I just, we had to make some decisions to honor God even, even before what, what we, and we want to help our kids. We want to bless our kids, and, 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 but we couldn't. We were not in a season to do that. Now, as a grandparent, come on, I got four and one on the way. They get everything they want now, amen, yeah. You want two? I'll give you three. You want a happy meal? Yeah. But in that season, in that season of where we're at, that season of testing, we said, God, we're going we're gonna to honor you. And some of you might be in that season. I, I tell you, there's a lot of hope. Trust God in it. You know, so in those years, God was faithful. Even beyond that, he met every need and so far beyond. So here's what we got to do. Uh, and we do these classes all the time at our church, uh, financial fitness classes. We used to do financial peace. Now it's called financial freedom because a lot of people just need to get on a budget they got to figure out what are my needs versus my wants. And that is dependent upon what you make income-wise. Your income determines what kind, like what do we have? Needs for a car, for housing, for clothes. And, you know, those are basic needs, right? And so your need for a car and what kind of car is based on your income. Like my dad used to say, son, you have champagne taste and a beer wallet. Under 30, they don't get that one, okay? But, but so you have to understand what your income is, how you got to do it. So if your income says, I've got the income uh, for a VW, even though I want a BMW, you have to get the VW. Maybe not forever. There's nothing wrong with BMW. It is wrong, though, when it robs God of first place in your life. And so maybe it's your house. I, I, I want a 3,000-square-foot house, but based on where we're at right now, it's going to be 1,500 square feet. 
right? Based on interest rates right now, it's crazy, right, for us. That's, that's another tough one. So whatever, whatever your, your clothing needs, you know, I mean, it depends on your income. I mean, I don't shop, but my wife helped me with this part of the message. You, some of you, TJ Maxx is where you need to go. For some of you, you can go to Nordstrom's. Neither one of them's wrong. It's based on your income. It's based on where you're at. And so we have to understand there's a part that we play in being a good steward of our finances so God can align us in the right way. The Bible tells us, let me just give you this last line. I said it once. God is not opposed to us owning nice stuff, but not when stuff owns us. I'm, I'm telling you, I, I live in a, a nice home now. I, I, I called my daughter uh, a couple years ago when we were, I, they moved on this lake. I said, Dara, can we, can we move next to you? Five doors down, there's an empty lot. She goes, yeah, that'd be great because I want to be near my grandkids. Not my kids, my grandkids. <laughs> you know, my, my daughter said to me one time when the kids are over, my grandkids, she goes, I just don't remember you loving me that much. I said, I had to parent you, right? <laughs> right? Some of the grandparents know who you're talking about. Anyway, and so now, you know, we, we live, uh, you know, in, on a, a, a lake next to my kids. And so you don't, you're not always there with a floral couch and the holes in the floorboard. But as you're faithful to God, God sees that. In fact, Ecclesiastes says this, those who love money will never have enough. It's a big one. You can just put the word stuff. Those who love stuff will never have enough. There's nothing wrong with stuff, but if you love it too much, and it restricts you from to doing what God wants you to do, you need to make some decisions. Those who love money will never have enough. How meaningless to think that wealth brings true happiness. So here's what we do. There, there's all of us, no matter what your income is, we do three things with our money, three things with our money. And the order in which we do it tells us if we're honoring God or not. They're gonna put it on the screen. Go ahead, put that next one, there it is right there. So the, the left side is how a lot of people live. It's me first, my lifestyle. Then if I have any left, I save. If there's any left of that, I'll just give God what's left over. That's not God's financial plan. And if you live that way, you'll always feel stress. You're always gonna feel overwhelmed. There's another financial plan that God wants you to live by. It's, it's God honoring. This way, you're honoring God and you're trusting God. This one, you're allowing fear or greed to control your life. And so on this one, it's God first, then I save, and then I spend. Then it's my lifestyle. If you can begin to reverse the order in your life, whether you're 25 or 55, you will see the, the hand of God working in your finances because God honors us when we follow his principles. This is, this is, this is what, what we began to do 43 years ago. So when you see that, it, it, you have to make a decision. What's the plan? You know, you have to plan to do something. You just can't, hey, that sounds good. Or you know what, it's just never, it's not the right time. You know, maybe next year when the kids graduate or when this happens, then I'll start. There's never a good time to begin to put God first financially. Do you understand? There's never a good time. There's never a good time to say, I want to start working out, but I'm going to wait till I feel good about it. No, you just do it. You make a decision. And here's what I know about God. This is what I love about the grace and the mercy of God in our lives. He just wants us to start. He just wants you to take a step. Because when I mention the word tithe to some of you and you hear 10%, you're overwhelmed. You know, Craig, there is no way. I could never do that because we are here. There's nothing. Then you know what I would tell you to do? I think God honors baby steps. And I say this to my church all the time. Take the first 2%. Maybe it's not 10, but say, God, I'm going to honor you with the first 2%. I've shared that many, many times over the years. I can't tell you how many testimonies, and they're here too, by the way. Well, I have someone come up to me, and Craig, the first time I heard you, I was mad. The second year I heard you, I said, you know what? He's right, but I can't do 10. I'm going to do two. And they go, now fast forward years later, I'm not at two. I'm not at four. I'm not at six. I'm at 10 or 12. It's amazing how they've seen the hand of God work because they decided to take baby steps towards God. That's what God's asking you to do. Take a baby step, take a step of faith and say, God, I'm gonna put you first, not me. I'm gonna trust you. You know, I mean, you wanna see, you wanna have a successful marriage? Put your spouse first. At the beginning, maybe you don't see any results, but if you do it consistently, you'll have a better marriage. Same thing with your finances. This isn't some get rich quick, I'm gonna try it for a week and see if it works. 
It's about putting God first. At, at my church, I haven't, I haven't done this in a while, but one time I did what I call a 90-day tithe challenge. Did some messages like this, and I said, for 90 days, I challenge you to tithe. And after 90 days, if you don't see tangible results in your life, in your marriage, in your finances, we'll give every dollar you gave back to you. And we have thousands of people. There are thousands that went through the tithe challenge. And you know how many people called back? One out of thousands called me and said, it's not working, my finances are worse. I didn't want to argue, I said, sure, we'll write you a check. But out of thousands of people, many said, I thank you that you caused me, you, you, I, I, I accepted the challenge. There's one verse, most of you know it, it's the Italian prophet Malachi in the Bible, right? You know that guy? He says this, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that it will be enough food in my temple. By the way, New Testament mentions tithing. Matthew 23, 23, Jesus confirms tithing. You can go back and read that. If you do, says the Lord of heaven, I will open the windows of heaven for you and I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have not room enough to take it in. I've experienced this in my life. Try it. Put me to the test. You know what he's saying? I double dog dare you. That's what God is saying to us. Your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's army. Tithing is a challenge, but it is a benefit. Take a step. There's one other verse a scripture I'd like to share. And I share this because I hear this a lot from people. Uh, especially people that make a lot of money and go, well, I don't know, 10% of my church, I make a lot of money and I think I can give here, here, here. And they go, what do you think? I said, it's not what I think, it's what the Bible says. Everywhere you see scripture used about the first fruits, the grain, uh, it's always talking about taking it to the house of the Lord. And so, you know, I would say to you, uh, where should I tithe? I believe the first 10% goes to the house of the Lord because the church is the hope of the world. This local church is the hope of Lakewood Ranch. The transformation, the healing, the lives that are touched and saved. I mean, come on, you guys got amazing church, amazing outreach. I mean, you have, listen, where you are led, where you are fed, and where you are cared for, that's where it should go. Amen, amen, yeah, I tell you. Now listen, and, and you, I've heard Chip speak, your pastor. Man, you talk about a meal. I mean, this guy serves you a meal. I'm not talking about a McDonald's hamburger. I'm talking about Ruth Chris steak. Amen. Is that what you get here? And so, and, and listen, we never eat at one restaurant and go somewhere else to pay the bill, do we? No, no, you, you don't. You, you give where you were fed and led and cared for. And, 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 and so I, I share that uh, because that'd probably be harder for a pastor of his own church to share, because it seems like, ah, uh, but I'm telling you, this the Bible tells us in 2 Chronicles, as soon as the commandment was circulated, the children of Israel brought in abundance the first fruits of grain and wine and oil and honey and all the produce of the field, and they brought it in, uh, brought it in abundantly. Here it is, the tithe of everything. Read a little further down. Since the people began to bring the offerings into where? Come on, everyone say it. The house of the Lord. We have had enough to eat and have plenty left for the Lord has blessed his people and what is left is this great abundance. I, I just see through scripture uh, throughout and all I could say is this as I, as I just kind of close. A year from now, your life will be different. Your marriage will be different. If you're single, you'll be different because I think these principles do work and he's a faithful God and, and you'll come back a year from now, and I know some of you are not amening it this year. Next year, you'll be the first one to say amen because there's testimonies all across this room of people. I see them nodding their heads. That's me. That's it. It's amazing all the financial coincidences that start happening in our lives when we give God the first part. How many of you have had some financial coincidences? Come on, a lot of you go, yeah, that's me, Craig. It happens. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name.